Hi again, everybody. Thanks for joining us on Celebrating Act Two. As you can see, Art and I are with the virtual gourmet himself, John Mariani. John, welcome. Good morning. Good morning, John. Good morning, Art. Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, uh, I love reading the uh, your newsletter, uh, johnmaria.com, the virtual gourmet. And uh, every so often you highlight uh, a luminary in, in the business. Uh, but there are so many really fine uh, uh, people in the business, whether they be restaurateurs. How do you, 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 and you recently did an obituary on somebody I had not heard of, Jasper White. But in general, how do you choose who it is that you will highlight in a bio? They're all very well written, but I was just wondering what is your thought process on highlighting somebody? Because there are a lot of people who you don't. Well, they have to be people, either restaurateurs or chefs, who have added measurably to the whole world of the restaurant business. Not just, hey, I know this great chef uh, in my in my neighborhood here. Everybody should go to this restaurant. That's a, that's a restaurant review. Well, these are people who have really formed what American gastronomy is today. They all had individual ideas. Oh, why didn't I think of that? Um, one most recently, which happened to be an obituary, because uh, I do profiles of them all the time, but this is an obituary from a man named Jasper White, who not single-handedly, but more than anybody else, uh, created new New England cuisine, that is modern New England cuisine out of Boston, where he had his own namesake restaurant, uh, Jasper White, and then a, uh, a couple of places called Summer Shack, which are more casual. And he was among the first with others like Lydia Shire, who he knew very well and worked with, to say, you know, all the restaurants here in Boston, first of all, they have a stodgy reputation or their places you go for fried seafood and clams and so forth. Um, but we really have such bounty here in New England, both out of the sea, which is obvious, but also on the land in our seasons. And they were the first to uh, really devote their menus to exemplifying the greatness that is uh, the New England provender and larder. And in all of their, so they would do, they would do a clam chowder, but it would be like any you'd ever tasted before. And they would use things like ramps and they would use fiddlehead ferns and raspberries in season. Um, they would do various preparations of lobster, which is one of the great New England treasures that we have. Um, things with corn, uh, uh, Indian pudding, brown bread, all of these things that had been either neglected or become like tourist items. You go for Boston baked beans at uh, Durgan Park and uh, some corn. <laughs> but these guys, he elevated it a great deal. So he, he certainly deserved a, a, a ringing obituary for his work. Um, others, uh, Danny Meyer, is a restaurateur, not a chef, who he was the first one back in New York 30 years ago to change service for fine dining by not making it, uh, well, he made it more casual because the waiters were not wearing tuxedos anymore. And they were young American waiters. And I got to give credit to uh, Michael McCarty <clears throat> out there in uh, Los Angeles and Santa Monica for having much the same idea a much more casual approach and friendliness on behalf of the um, the waiters and the staff, coupled with extraordinary uh, modern Italian and American cuisine. And uh, if you think, well, what's so difficult? Well, go back 30 years and you wouldn't find that. He was hiring young Americans. There's always the would-be actors and models and so forth. But he really put them through their faces. That, Do you really want to work here as a waiter? or a captain, or a sommelier. I want you to really interact with people. And it changed everything. Um, the other thing he did, aside from opening a slew of excellent restaurants, all in New York, because he wants to be able to control them, not go out to Vegas and so forth, is he opened um, the chain uh, Shake Shack, which I'm sure you have many of uh, in California. Sure. Yeah. And that was his, and he's from the Midwest. And he says, boy, you know, I remember when I was a kid what the hamburgers, those smash burgers used to taste like, and the crinkle cut. Um, and he opened it just as a pop-up, but it became so popular <clears throat> and milkshakes, Shake Shack, 
after that, he opened another on the Upper West Side, and then boom, 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 it just uh, exploded. And I don't even think, and I've told Danny that I think is the best hamburgers in, in America. But it, okay. again, the ambiance, it was the way things were served. Uh, so Danny is a very, very important and very much alive uh, person. Um, another one is Thomas Keller, who is the chef owner at the French Laundry up in uh, Napa Valley. <clears throat> and he his revolution was, first of all, to focus on a long tasting menu, which is not my favorite thing to do, but I never forget when I ate there at the French Laundry in Yautville. And the food was absolutely exquisite. Um, it was probably an eight, nine, ten course meal. Uh, from the bur first bite of the bread made on the premises to the choices of the, the wines, an extraordinary list, focusing in on specifically California wines from Napa and Sonoma and elsewhere. And then through every dish that followed, um, it was innovative, inventive, creative, beautifully presented, and focused in on the essence of that dish. So it wasn't one of these frou-frou kind of dishes, all sorts of things, extraneous dishes um, out of them. But uh, he was one of the first of the American chefs to do that. <clears throat> and then years and years later, well, he op opened Bouchon, which was his little French bistro there in Yountville, and another place called Ad Hoc, in which he had a different menu every single day. But all of it, including his fried chicken, which was, I think, Wednesdays, and you couldn't get into the place. You had a reservations months in advance to eat his fried chicken. He proved that there are no bad dishes or even mediocre dishes. There's only bad cooks. Uh, so then he opened Per Se, which is kind of French Laundry East here in New York City, which has about uh, 12, 15 courses and costs like $600. And it is an extravagant restaurant. But uh, again, he set a style of cuisine in New York that um, we just hadn't seen uh, before, even in the finest French restaurants of the city. Um, and uh, all over the country have popped up places like that uh, in in uh, the shadow of his, uh, his eminence. So uh, th those are three of them. I have one coming up about Michael LaMonaco, who um, had a great uh, – uh, he was the chef of the World Trade Center. It's an interesting story that on 9-11, he walked into the building, and uh, he says, oh, you know, i got to get my eyeglasses fixed, a little, a little screw in there. He stopped there instead of taking the elevator, as usual, at 8.01 in the morning, and boom – and he got out, and not a single one of his workers I, uh, I remember. Uh, survived. And he was in shock for months and, and years. He really could barely operate. But what he did was open Porterhouse, which is now, I think, the quintessential great New York steakhouse, which is only on the fourth floor, not the 107th of um, uh, Columbus Circle. <clears throat> it's a beautiful restaurant. The food is superb. The, the meat is just, uh, the steaks are just non-pareil and a great wine list. And it kind of sets a standard. There are, there are steaks as good as what Michael serves in his restaurant, but um, there's none better, let's put it that way. And everything else about it is quite spectacular. Hmm. So those well, are the John, spotlight. I have to compliment you because these um, profiles and interviews you do with uh, people, uh, the, the, the business people in the world of gastronomy, are wonderful. Mm. Uh, they're revealing. Uh, they're fascinating people. And they really make, uh, for me at any rate, they make the world of food and travel come alive. So mm. I, I appreciate that. It's a, it's a wonderful aspect of uh, your newsletter, The Virtual Gourmet, um, and makes it special. Yeah, I, I have to recommend to anybody who hasn't been uh, to johnmariani.com and, and read your newsletters, you've archived them back for years, and there's a yeah. richness to the stories, which is actually why I asked the question, because they're not just uh, a story about somebody, but there's a richness to it, and the, for revealing how you made your choices in the first place sort of will add a lot for me yeah. as I'm reading them to understand why you chose that person. There's probably a real special reason for it. 
Well, thank you both. And, and but, you know, these are all guys who have been in the business for 30, 40 years. They've seen the ups and downs, the recessions, the dot com bust, 9 11, uh, COVID. They've been through it all and lasted and are still get up in the morning and just can't wait to get to work to serve you and me and everybody else. Yeah. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube. And tell your friends, Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life.